welcome to our program, From House to House. Won't you come in and join us for a while in the Word? Please join us for a time in God's Word. The ladies and, and I would, we would like to just have you spend a little time with us and uh, let's grow together in the Lord. Uh, we want to say thank you again for the use of the beautiful home of Kevin and Talitha Bayerlin, making our filming possible to bring you the beauty of the work that they have done on their home. Now, let's uh, continue on, ladies, as we move along in this 12-part series that we have called Filling the Gap, where we're talking about holes or void spaces, perhaps created in, in a wall, or the Bible speaks of a hedge, and how that is a dangerous, precarious situation, unless something fills that void in, fills that hole in, that break, and uh, the continuity, let's say, perhaps of the hedge or the wall. The Lord looks for individuals He can use that will volunteer to move in and fill these crisis situations. And I hope the Spirit of God will call and use many of you who are listening, and you will see a need, and the Lord will move upon you to be His instrument. You can't do it in the flesh. You can't do it in your own strength or your own wisdom or your own psychology. It's going to be go with God. As you lean upon God and you ask for the Lord to accompany you and manifest Himself through you, He will use you, as we taught in our last class, like perhaps that joint connector to fill in that gap and make up the hedge. All right, ladies, let's turn to and get our Bibles ready. Let's turn to the book of Acts in the New Testament. Let's go to chapter 10. We'll be looking at verse 34 and 35. And today is lesson number six. We're calling this one, Respect of persons, having to do with a gap where there is a respect of persons, having to do with being partial. You know, you can have respect of persons as you say, oh, well, if they're wealthy, yeah, that person is okay for me. If they're not, oh, I don't want to have time for them. Or you say, oh, this person is very intellectual and I want to be intellectual, so you know, they're fine for my company, but someone maybe who doesn't have that education, you look down upon them. Or maybe because they're of a different spiritual background and there's a gap there between you and them that you're allowing because you think they're not on your level. Well, the Lord is not a respecter of persons. Thank God. Just think with all of us, many different kind of individuals involved in the body of Christ and the kingdom of God, it would be terrible if our Lord and Savior had respect of persons, if there were just certain types of people that God thought was okay or that He wanted to be in His kingdom. No, He's not selective in that sense. It's whosoever will may come, my friend. Isn't that wonderful? Whosoever will may come and drink of the water of life freely. So I don't care what your background is or who you are, your lifestyle, whatever. Jesus still today calls forth and He says, Come, come, follow me. Come, follow me. That's what he would say always. We read in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it was that word, come. He, he invites you, whosoever will, may come, because he is not a respecter of persons. Now, there is a great gap in many a circumstance because of these differences of viewing someone different than the other. We can do it when it has to do with... Uh, Doctrines, denominations, racial, so forth. But that's not pleasing to the Lord. The Lord would bring down the barriers. He would break down the barriers. He, and he used an individual called Peter to do that very thing, to help break down the barrier be, because God wanted to show the church in Peter's day of the New Testament church that God was not a respect of persons, especially between the Jew and the Gentile, that the Lord uh, came 
uh, to fulfill the prophecies in the Old Testament that spoke of how the light would even come to the Gentiles. Oh, thank God for that. Because many of us, where would we be if it had not been that the Lord opened the door and said, you Gentiles also are included to come in. We're, we're that branch, that olive branch that's been grafted in, you know, to the original stock of the tree of the Jewish. Thank God for the Jewish people people and their Jewish heritage, I thank God for them so much because they're the ones that's brought us the, the Word of God and that shows us uh, the way to Christ and who God is and a respect for Him and the reality of Him. So we're grateful for that setup that they provide for us, but the Gentiles have been grafted in by the grace of God. But let's see how God used Peter back in the New Testament days in order to make that compatible and workable. So we've turned right, ladies, to Acts 10. Let's look at verse 34 through 35. And we're going to see how he is using to, uh, being used of God to negotiate compatibility between the Jewish people and the Gentile people that are coming to Christ as their Savior. And Peter opened his mouth and said, Most certainly and thoroughly, I now perceive and understand that God shows no partiality and is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he who venerates and has a reverential fear for God, treating him with worshipful obedience and living uprightly is acceptable to him and sure of being received and welcomed by him. Well, the scripture says it, in a magnificent way, just what I was trying to express to you in my own uh, vernacular. You see, there was a need and there was hunger with the Gentile people. You know, the gospel was preached first to the Jew, and we know the disciples, they were all Jewish men. The people there at uh, Pentecost that were filled with the Spirit in the upper room, they were Jewish people they began to assume that, you know, it was all about just them, them and God, them and God. And they weren't quite open to accept that God was going to also share his gracious gift of salvation and the things of the Spirit with the Gentiles. Because, you know, there was such a barrier between these uh, difference of na nationality. But God is always ready to reach out to those that are hungry and the thirsty. You know, it speaks of how the eyes of the Lord, they, they run to and fro throughout the earth. And, and he's looking for hungry hearts. And I believe sincere hungry hearts, God provides a way somehow that the truth comes to them. And the Gentiles were hungry. They were, many of them were open. Yes, not all, but many of them were open and searching for an answer to life. And when the gospel came to them, they readily received it. Many of them did as we could see in the missionary journeys of Paul, how that he could establish all these Gentile churches. Well, there were hungry hearts there. And you know, the Holy Spirit, he reminds me of what I read of in the book of Proverbs, ladies, and I'm gonna ask you to turn there quickly. And that is in Proverbs 31. We're gonna read verse 20. Proverbs 31, verse 20 in the King James, and it speaks of a virtuous woman. And let's see the symbolic picture that is there. It says, She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. The virtuous woman, we could apply that to just natural, practical, everyday life with a woman, and usually that text is used for women on Mother's Day, which is nice. But you know, the Word of God has various layers to it and depths of beautiful truth. And you could see this not only depict the average woman in the household, but it also can picture uh, uh, the church as a whole, his bride, his church. It's a picture of that with symbolic meaning. And then it also can depict growth and stages of an individual in the church or in the body of Christ as we are growing in the Lord. And there's so much beauty there in Proverbs 31. I've, I don't think I've ever done a series uh, for television on that, whereas we used to do it in congregations. But one of the aspects of the, a virtuous woman, let's liken it to the, to the church, Christ's bride, and the individuals that make that up, which would be you and I as individuals. 
It says what she, one of the things she's going to be compelled to do because she has virtue, which means efficacy. One of its meanings is efficacy, which means the power of God to produce an effect. The power of God that can produce an effect. She has virtue flowing out through her. That symbolizes the Holy Spirit. And what will the Holy Spirit in her cause her to do, the church to do, or the individual in the church of Christ to do? Those that are really wanting to be a part of that bride of Christ. It, she's going to reach, she's going to stretch, stretch. Now, when you stretch, that's not just a, a casual reaching forth. But when you, you are being stretched, do you know what I mean by that? You're pulling at those muscles. She stretcheth out her hand to who? The poor. And yea, she not only stretches, but she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. Yes, this could be interpreted as just natural needs, natural poverty. But oh, think about many people who have things. They may have luxuries. They may have prosperity. But really their lives are very poor. Their lives are very needy when it comes to eternal life, when it comes to spiritual things, things that will last forever of eternal value. They're poor in spirit and they're, they're poor in, in knowing the things of God. And so the virtue within compels that her hands go forth with a stretch, not just reaching forth, but stretching them. And <laughs> I must say to some of you ladies, have you ever felt like God is, is stretching you? Oh, yeah, you feel, you feel the discomfort of being stretched. But she's reaching out there, reaching forth her hands to where there's need. Well, that's like the Holy Spirit. Uh, I've seen where in a congregation and ministry is going forth, how the Holy Spirit knows just the individuals, where they are in the pews, where they are seated, that have really come with a hungry, crying out heart to God, desperate to be touched by the things of God. The Holy Spirit knows right where they're at and he ministers to them because he's more concerned about those that are really hungry and seeking and thirsting after righteousness than just people who are just filling space and time. So it's like, it's like a magnetic pull, if I could use that as an expression. When the Holy Spirit is operative, it's like a magnetic pull to where? To the hungry, to the seeking, because God knows exactly where they're at. And uh, that's what the Spirit of God in us and through us will be doing. I would question if you're not being compelled by the Holy Spirit in your life to reach out to where there are truly hungry, needy hearts, then are you really doing much for the kingdom of God? Because that's where the Spirit of God is operative, is where there is need. Let's read it in the Amplified, ladies. It says, she opens her hand to the poor. And I want you to see this as a symbolic poor, a symbolic needy, okay? She opens her hand to the poor, yea, she reaches out her filled hands to the needy, whether in body, mind, or spirit. So we see we're just not talking about the physical and the natural. We're talking about mentally and spiritually, the poor and the needy. The Spirit of God through that virtue of Christ. Remember how Jesus expressed that virtue had flowed out of him? What was he talking about? That was efficacy. That was the power of God that could produce an effect and heal the woman who had the issue of blood. That Holy Spirit, that same Holy Spirit has been invested and deposited in us and the purpose of it is not to be dammed up within us just to make us feel good, but to flow out and reach out to where there is the need and the hunger. Because like a magnetic pool, that's where it's seeking, that's where it flows. Well, Peter was used of God to reach out to the Gentiles because out there among the Gentile field, there was this hunger, there was this need. But you know what? The people downtown at the big church, down in Jerusalem, the Jewish uh, church council, the apostles, disciples, they were, they were happy to have it be just among themselves with among the Jews. The Lord kind of had to disturb their nice nest. In one place it speaks in the book of Acts how there, there was persecution that came and what did it do? It scattered the believers. Well, you know, that was like taking the, the, the coals in a fireplace and just tossing them out. And what did it do? It spread the fire. Praise the Lord. God had to allow 
the persecution to come to spread the church, to get her out of her comfortable nest and to move her out so that she took the gospel to the nations round about her and to bring down this barrier of prejudice, this barrier of partiality and showing respect to persons because that can be a gap. That is a gap that needs to be filled and God used Peter to do it. And now we're going to um, continue on reading about how God used Peter to do it. Isn't it wonderful? Ladies, we won't turn there, but James 4, verse 8, the first part of that verse says, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. That's what he's looking for. Those that are hungry, those that are thirsty, those that want to draw nigh to God. And what will happen? The spirit of God will extend himself as hands reaching forth, stretching even to reach out to you. You take one step, the Holy Spirit takes, I would say, at least two. All right, ladies, you have that Acts 10, verse 1 through 5, and let's read it, and where we're going to see how God used Peter uh, to fill in a gap. Now, living at Caesarea, there was a man whose name was Cornelius, a centurion captain of what was known as the Italian Regiment, a devout man who venerated God and treated him with reverential obedience, as did all his household. And he gave much alms to the people, and he prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour, about 3 p.m. of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God entering and saying to him, Cornelius, and he gazing intently at him, became frightened and said, What is it, Lord? And the angel said to him, Your prayers and your generous gifts to the poor have come up as a sacrifice to God and have been remembered by him. And now send a job and have them call for and invite here a certain Simon, whose surname is Peter. This man, though he was not a New Testament believer yet and really a follower of Jesus Christ, he had a very limited concept of God, but you know, he was generous, he was compassionate, he, he even helped the Jews. The Jews even liked him, even though he was a Gentile and a Roman soldier, in fact, who uh, was there, stationed there in the land of Israel. And Caesarea, in fact, that is there uh, uh, along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea in Palestine. And he had, had a lot of authority. He was a man of significance in the Roman army in that he was a captain of at least 100 Roman soldiers that were occupying Israel there. And normally there would be animosity or feelings of uh, a gap, we might say, of distance between these Roman soldiers lording their authority over the Jewish people. And so um, it was not typical that the Jews would want to associate with him. But this man, because he was so rare in heart, even though he wasn't at that time a follower of Christ, it said he prayed a lot. He prayed continually. He gave alms. He had a fear of God. And um, he was just like those I spoke of. He had hunger. He had thirst. He was seeking. He was seeking. He was limited in his knowledge. But what happened? The gap there between him and God needed to be filled so that there could be a connection. God used Peter to move into the scene and bring the two together, a greater light, a greater understanding. Maybe some of you have come from religious backgrounds and God has used someone to step into your life in a way that they have connected you on to further truth and into the light because the path of the just is like a shining light and it grows more and more to the perfect day. So very possibly you could say, Carol, that's my testimony. God used so-and-so and that person is the one that made it possible that I stepped out of where I was limited in my seeking God unto a place of a greater, grander view of who Jesus really is. Now, let's go to Acts 11. We're kind of moving along here in the book of Acts. And we're going to see how that um, this gap, gap between Cornelius and God, though he was a seeker of God, Peter was used to step in and fill the void. So we're going to look at Acts 11, verse 1 through 4, verse 15 through 18. It says, Now the apostles, special messengers, and the brethren who were throughout Judea heard with astonishment that the Gentiles, heathen, also had received and accepted and welcomed the word of God, the doctrine concerning the attainment through Christ of salvation in the kingdom of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, 
The circumcision party, certain Jewish Christians found fault with him, separating themselves from him in a hostile spirit, opposing and disputing and contending with him and saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and even eat with them? But Peter began at the beginning and narrated and explained to them step by step the whole list of events. And this is what he said. He said, when I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them just as he did on us at the beginning. Then I recalled the declaration of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with, be placed in, introduced into the Holy Spirit. If then God gave to them the same gift equally as he gave to us, when we believed in, adhered to, trusted in, and relied on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I and what power of authority had I to interfere or hinder or forbid or withstand God? When they heard this, they were quieted and made no further objection. And they glorified God saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance unto real life after resurrection. How did God do that? Well, God gave Peter a vision. He was up, up above where he was staying, up above, uh, up on the top. And he was uh, there and God brought him into uh, like a vision, a trance. And God let him see the sheet let down with all these unclean animals that according to the law in the book of Leviticus chapter 11, though we, though we won't turn there, you see all these forbidden things were not supposed to eat. The Jews were not to eat and they were very careful to obey that, especially Peter. And they were called common and unclean. And the Lord let that down before him and he, God said to him, he said, rise and eat, Peter. And Peter said, oh Lord, I've never, you know, eaten those kind of things. And the Lord said, don't you call what I have cleansed common and unclean. This was an illustration God was given to prepare Peter for his mission to fill this gap. And he was likening how the Jew looked down upon the Gentiles like dogs and like, you know, they just, they wouldn't go in, they weren't to go into their houses. They weren't to eat with them. There was such a prejudice. There was such a gap between these nationalities. And here God calls a man named Peter who is used to living the strict life and God causes him to be called to a, some, a contrary situation because of his Jewish custom. And boy, was that a big gap. And so he went obediently. He went to Cornelius' house and, and there he began to speak to him about the things of God. God worked on both ends. Cornelius to prepare him that Peter would be coming. He worked on Peter to make him willing to go. He went to the house and Cornelius had his relatives there, his family there. He invited others in. He had his house full of people hungry, hungry, just like I said, the Holy Spirit reaching out hands stretched forth to the hungry and the needy. And what happened is he began to talk to him about the things of Jesus. The Holy Ghost fell upon them. They got filled with the Holy Spirit and they spake in other tongues, just like it happened in the book of Acts, where in the upper room, and uh, what could Peter do? I'm sure he stood there for a moment with his mouth open, astonished that God would fill these people with, in the same way with the gift of the Holy Ghost, just like the apostles had received uh, on the day of Pentecost. And so uh, there was a problem. The Jewish church there could not accept the idea that these Gentiles were going to be a part of their body. Peter was used to fill the gap because there was no respect of persons with God. He didn't show respect of persons. God wouldn't let him. And he brought to the New Testament believers, the Jewish body, the fact that they had to receive them as brethren in the faith, because God bore witness to that by filling them the same way the apostles had been filled. Today, there are barriers. There are gaps between even body of believers. It might have to do with race, it might have to do with denomination. It may have to do with doctrine. Sometimes you see the difference in the gap between those that are traditional in their worship and those that are fundamental. Between those that are evangelical, those that are non-spirit filled and those that are what they claim to be full gospel, the spirit filled. God is looking for those barriers to come down and as it says in Ezekiel 22, verse 30, God says, I'm looking for a man 
I've sought for a man to stand in the gap and make up this hedge. Child of God, maybe God is calling upon you to fill a gap, to make up the hedge where there has been shown a respect of persons. Please join us next time when we'll talk about the subject of fit for the job as we continue the subject of filling the gap. God bless you. Amen. Program copies available. Full set of 12 lessons on CDs, $34. DVDs, $44. Add $3 for shipping and handling, no COD. Original Carol Brook song album, audio cassettes, $10 each. CDs, $14 each. Add $3 for shipping and handling, no COD. For orders and support gifts only, call 619-445-4748, Pacific Time, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m or visit our website at www.carolbrookministries.com. For more information, please contact Carol Brook Ministries Incorporated, P.O. Box 1909, Alpine, California, 91903. On the internet, visit www.carolbrookministries.com or email carolbrook at carolbrookministries.com. Prayer line number 541-592-4539. Pacific Time, 8 a.m. through 8 p.m.